Turn with me tonight to 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're looking at the life of Elijah, thinking tonight about life out of death, 1 Kings 17. And as we stand together, we're going to begin with the 17th verse of this chapter. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times, and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, And the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Spirit of God, take the Word of God and implant deep in our hearts the application that we may live it and that we may be drawn closer and closer to the Lord God in the name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Tonight, We continue our study on the life of Elijah. And you remember that God is teaching Elijah to live by faith. It began when God sent him to confront the wicked king Ahab. And we read about Elijah walking into the throne room of the king and telling the king that there would be no rain in the land because of his sin. And the Bible says there came a terrible drought. And the people were starving and the people are upset and they're beginning to blame King Ahab for the problem. And Ahab is angry because the people are angry. And Ahab is upset because the people are upset. And Ahab is blaming the prophet Elijah. And he's looking for him. And in the midst of all this, God sent Elijah to the brook Kirith and all his needs were meant there. You remember we studied about how God provided him with water from the brook and the ravens fed him fish every morning and every evening. And then came a day when the brook dried up and God sent Elijah to Zarephath. Interesting to me that God sent Elijah to hide in Jezebel's hometown, but that's where he sent him. And if you look up Zarephath on a map, you're going to find that it is right on the Mediterranean. And that's how good God is. God hit Elijah on the beach, right on the shore of the Mediterranean. And now Elijah has free room and board. And once again, God sustains him. This time through a barrel of flour that will never run dry and a jar of oil that always has enough to make cakes of bread to keep Elijah and the widow and her son alive. We are told here in Scripture that in this house, Elijah had his own private chamber. So here he is in the midst of a severe famine, and he does not miss a single meal. God is taking care of him. God is providing for him. And he is at perfect peace, learning to trust God for every need, for every provision in his life. And God sent Elijah to this woman, this widow, and her son, 
And we get a little bit of insight about this woman as we look at the scriptures. There are only three statements recorded in the Bible from this woman. And every time she said something, she complained. Only three statements, and all of them were complaints. Do you know anybody like that? That gives us a clue as to what she was like. When I think of this widow woman, I think of Proverbs 21.9 that says, Better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. So here, all she did was complain. But we think about her life, and she had a lot of problems in her life. She was a widow. Her husband had died. She was left with a son, and she was trying to raise this boy by herself. And things were not easy for this woman. We are not told that she had any friends, that there were no relatives around. She seems to be all by herself. And when Elijah came along, in the providence of God, she is down to her last morsel of food. So maybe she had a reason to complain. She had seen it pretty rough. And one thing that I notice here in Scripture is that this widow woman did not know God. Did you catch that in Scripture? Go back to verse 12 of 1 Kings 17 and look at what it says. Verse 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives. Did you catch that? She said to Elijah, as the Lord your God lives. Apparently, the Lord was not her God. He was Elijah's God. More than likely, this widow woman was a pagan. So God used Elijah in her home to change her perspective and to bring her to a place in her life where she would put her faith in God. And that's what we see going on in this story. And at the same time, God uses this widow woman to teach Elijah the prophet some lessons that will help him later as he stands before the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Look again at verse 17. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman became sick. After what things? What's this in reference to? After the miraculous provision of food for Elijah and the widow and her son, we are told her son became sick. Now look at the remainder of the verse. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. In other words, the boy died. We're not told what his sickness was, but we are told that it was a sickness to death, that he stopped breathing, that he died. I think in my estimation, there could be nothing worse than this. This woman had no husband to walk with her through this tragedy. She had no other children. Apparently, she had no friends. And now her son is gone. Can you imagine the emotion that she must have felt? We don't know how old the boy was, but we know that she lived for him. And the death of her son meant an overwhelming sense of loneliness and despair in her life. Her life had been nothing but disappointment and disaster, and the only bright part of her life was her son. I imagine she dreamed that he would marry and have children and carry on the family name, but now he is gone. The death of her son meant hopelessness for her, as long as her son was there, she knew there would be somebody to take care of her when she grew old. Maybe she was thinking as she was getting older that he would look after her in her old age. But now, she has no one. And I want to insert something here as we look at this story. While all of this looks very, very bad, we have to remember, folks, God is at work behind the scenes. And when things look very, very bad, it is helpful to remember that God is always working behind the scenes. In spite of the pain, in spite of the sorrow, 
In spite of the loneliness and the despair, God is at work. And I don't usually like to give you the end of the story before I give you the rest of the story, but this time I will. Look down at verse 24. Verse 24, where this woman ended up. Scripture says, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. So do you see what happened? Through this experience, this widow turned to God. Through this experience, this widow woman placed her faith in God. She believed. She said she knew two things. She knew Elijah was a prophet of God, a man of God, and she knew that the things he told her about the Lord were true. I remember reading about Lehman Strauss, a great Bible teacher. He was teaching at a Bible conference in Michigan and Grand Rapids, and during that week, his wife was dying, and he was called and told that she was going to live only a few more days. And at the same time, while he taught that week, he learned that his son Richard had cancer. And here's what he said. He said, I've been preaching this stuff all of my life that God is enough. And he said, men, I want to tell you, I know God is enough. Amen? He is enough. Life's not easy. We go through tragedies and turmoil, but God is enough. Can you say amen? He is enough. And after that, Lehman Strauss wrote a book called In God's Waiting Room. And sometimes God puts us in the waiting rooms of life. He had this widow in his waiting room. He was teaching her some things. He had Elijah in his waiting room, teaching him some things. I want to show you just two or three things tonight. Number one, we see the faithfulness in Elijah's life. The faithfulness in Elijah's life. I want you to see what this woman thought when her son died. Look back in verse 18 and you see her initial reaction. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And she's angry. She is filled with venom. And there's something here that might not meet our eye at first reading, but I want you to catch this. She watched the faithfulness in Elijah's life, and his faithfulness pointed out the shortcoming in her own life. She noticed how Elijah was living for God, and that revealed to her how far away she was from God. She looked at her own life, and she looked at Elijah's life, and she noticed he was living for God, and she was not. She was not living the same life that Elijah was living. And so what does she conclude? She concludes that her son died because God was punishing her for not living for him. But that was not true. I want to remind you of a truth, though, that we see in this text. The faithfulness of your life will bring conviction to those around you. That's the application. The faithfulness of your life will bring conviction to those around you. I remember when I was a boy, my dad worked in textile management for 50 years. And once a year... A group of businessmen would travel to Atlantic City for a uh, hosiery show. And several times, he'd get me out of school and let me go with them. And I can remember when they would stop to eat at different places, that everybody at the table would order an alcoholic drink. But my dad never did. He didn't say anything about it. He never made a big deal over it. Never said anything to me about it. I was just a kid, but I noticed it. Everybody was drinking, but he just didn't do it. And I always admired his faithfulness. He taught a Sunday school class young people for 50 years. He was married to the same woman for 69 years. 
He was faithful. And he never said anything about it. But I saw faithfulness as I observed his life. And that's what this widow woman saw in the life of Elijah. The faithfulness in Elijah's life spoke. And if we really live for God, and we are faithful to God, then others will be convicted by the way that we live without us ever saying a word. Now, it's always good to say a word about Jesus. But it's better to live for Jesus. Amen? And people can see the life of an individual. And this is the principle that we find in 1 Peter 3.1, which tells us that if we are married to an unsaved spouse, we ought to live so as without a word, our faithfulness to God will draw them to Christ. Our lives bring conviction to other people. And Elijah's faithfulness convicted this woman. And conviction is always the first step toward God. A person cannot get saved until they realize they have sinned. And they only realize they have sinned when they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. So this woman, by the faithfulness of Elijah's life, was convicted of her own sin. Here's the second thing that I see. And that is the kindness of Elijah's heart. Look at verse 19. And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. What would you have done if you had been Elijah in this situation? Her son is dead. She is angry and upset at Elijah because her son is dead. But look at Elijah's example. Such a wonderful example. And we see here in this scripture the tenderness, the kindness of Elijah's heart. Verse 19, he said, give me your son. He just responds with, with kindness. Because Elijah knew that this woman was expressing anger out of her grief. Out of the hurt in her heart. And so very gently, Elijah said, let me have your son. And I can see him as he took that boy in his arms and he made his way to the upper chamber, which was away from everything and away from everyone. Elijah did not want to pray the prayer that he was about to pray in front of this woman who did not know his God. He went to be a, alone with God to wrestle for this boy's life. Someone said, he who prays only for others to hear has never really prayed. And that's true. You really want to pray, you get alone with God. That's when you really pray. And that's what Elijah did. Notice his prayer. Really, he prays two prayers here. He has two requests. The first one is in verse 20. He prayed, O Lord my God, have you also brought this tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? Elijah's feeling the pain himself. He sees another tragedy in the life of this woman. And he says, God, how much more? God, first the pain from the famine, and now the pain of losing her son. And then he prays a second prayer in verse 21. He said, oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Now Elijah was an introvert. He was a recluse. He was not people-centered. He's alone with God and he's begging from his own bedchamber for the life of this child. And Elijah stretched himself out, the Bible says, on this child three times and he prayed. Why did he do that? I think Elijah put his soul into his prayer with everything that he had. He, he laid atop that boy and he cried out to God to restore the boy's soul. And you know, it was forbidden by the letter of the law in Leviticus for a man of God to touch a dead body. 
But Elijah was more concerned with the spirit of the law than he was the letter of the law. And that's something the Pharisees never understood. Something they didn't get. He cared for that boy more than he cared for external religion. And by stretching himself out on the corpse of that boy, Elijah was reenacting in front of God his own powerlessness. He was saying, God, I can't do anything. I am as powerless as this dead corpse. And if you don't do something, God, it is a hopeless situation. It is all up to you. We see in Elijah's life the kindness of his heart. And then we finish tonight with one final thing. And that is the ability of Elijah's Lord. And I'm thankful for this way the story ends. The ability of Elijah's Lord. He stretched out his body three times and watch what happens. This widow woman is about to experience the ability of Elijah's Lord. Verse 24, Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him. Verse 22, And he revived. Now listen. This is the first restoration from death to life in the Bible. And it is a perfect picture of the power of God over death. The same God who brought this boy back to life is the same God who raised Jesus Christ from the grave. And He is the same God who someday, when the trumpet sounds, that will raise the dead in Christ too. Amen? That's the ability of God. He is the God of resurrections. Now look at verse 23 and see what this woman saw. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. I can imagine that. Can you imagine that in your mind? Elijah taking that child in his arms, walking down out of that loft to the entrance of the house seeing the mother sitting in that room, waiting in anguish, her head buried in her hands. She's weeping, and Elijah walks right up in front of her and says, Look! See! Your son lives! Can you imagine that moment in the life of that woman? And she looks up, and she thinks it is almost too good to be true, and her tears of grief turn to tears of joy. She's overcome with emotion. I I want to tell you something. God, this story tells us God cares desperately about us. God loves us. And we need that truth in our lives. Now look at verse 24 and see how she responds. Now by this I know that you are a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Notice she went from saying, your God, to my God. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful story that we've studied tonight. Let me leave you with two very brief thoughts. Just two thoughts. Whatever you take from this story, I pray that you will get hold of this. We see in Elijah the power of a godly life. And there is nothing as powerful in this life as the power of a godly life. What this woman saw God do in Elijah's life and for Elijah and for her son changed her life. Second, this story teaches us there is no power on this earth like the power of prayer. No power on earth like the power of prayer. Elijah prayed and God answered. And that is why James wrote later the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, God brought life out of death that day. But think of this. He did that not only physically, but He also did that spiritually. The boy was physically dead, but the mother was spiritually dead. And that day, God brought them both back to life, and all of God's people said, Amen.
Now I want to ask you, has God given you spiritual life? Do you know for certain, were you to die this night, that you would live forever in heaven? If you do not know that, you can know that by trusting Jesus to save you. And we invite you to come and receive Christ as we stand to sing, You Come.